follow it in and you believe that there's there is a way to bring about peace on earth in a form sense you know have a happy picture have a happy ending in that sense the, the course is saying that that you need to let go of your way of seeing the world as you see it in order to come to peace of mind that the that the world was made as an attack on God not like the world has elements of it that are um, that are very positive and that just by flushing out all of the, the negative that you will be left with a positive world which is a, a common approach to say like that Disney world <laughs> <laughs> no problem or Michael Jackson he, he made this menagerie of all yeah. kinds of rides and everything and paradise uh, trying to make it paradise <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's again we started to get into it the other night where there it's kind of like any time you're using the world or the body for the ego's purposes it's an attack but many of the ego's purposes seem to be quite nice and that's why there are many forms of attack that the mind doesn't recognize so it still believes that they're helpful when it's really still attacking probably the most subtle and the most deceptive of all of those is what Jesus spends about nine chapters on is the special love relationship it seems to be a haven you know it seems to offer lots of good things wonderful feelings of warmth and connectedness and you know you could say it's the old you and me against the world <laughs> bad as the world they seem to be we've got like barricades up because we've got a haven here and it seems very attractive and it's not seen that it's an attack it's, it's still an ego motive or still an ego motive behind it and that any attack again is like an attack on God it's, it's, it's attacking the uh, it's, there's not an attack in truth but it's keeping the mind from awareness of truth and reality so to me when it gets to non-compromise it really has come down to following it down step by step and really um, questioning what are the ways that, that I still or what are the beliefs, what are the concepts, what are the ways of attack that I'm still not recognizing. Help me Jesus, help me understand what those are and help me lay them aside. Okay. I, I guess when I first heard that, yeah, I, I sort of slipped back into this thing of you know how fundamentalists are you know there's only one right way to do things and they are uncompromising in that way. And uh, I guess that's what I was thinking about at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Form and content. We talked a little bit about how a lot of ways that have been like black or white thinking have have bogged down into form. Mm -hmm. This is the only way. This is the only path to reach God. Or these are the do's and the don'ts in form. And these are the sins. <laughs> you can't do these and go to heaven. And these are the good things good deeds and you need to do lots of those to get to heaven and what we're talking about is non-compromising in terms of thought or thinking that in a sense there is only one right way in the sense of right mindedness but that's at the purpose level or at the mind level as contrasted with wrong mindedness of the ego so to get clear on that is really important and that's why we try to go very very deep in all of our talks and discussions and when we get together to get down to a real discernment of, of right-mindedness versus wrong-mindedness so that we don't tolerate ego thinking in our own minds. And that's where I do, I tolerate, I still tolerate because again I still value some of those and those are the things that I relinquish every day. <laughs> Every morning after meditations, you know, I relinquish those things to the Holy Spirit to, um, because, again, I seem to still value them, you know, and I don't know how to let them go because they seem so real. Yeah, that question was before. I mean, you know, there's a, some of the passages in the Course where it just goes on, like one of them is in the Gift of Lilies, I think, look at all the trinkets made to hang upon the body and on and on about things, and it's like, my gosh, he seems to be getting awful specific here. <laughs> you know, he's talking about clothes and jewelry, and on and on and on. 
but it's kind of like, what is it for? And to me, the whole thing was going to the metaphysics. If I'm trying to draw attention to the body, then I'm, what am I teaching? You know, whether it's, you know, with certain kind of what might be called risque kind of clothing or different things, it goes more and more is, am I, am I, am I teaching my brother and myself that I'm a body and that attention should be drawn and focused on the body, or am I focusing on the mind and the spirit? And again, until you get to those metaphysics, it may be seem like, what's the big deal, Jesus? Does it matter what I wear? You know, that could seem like, hey, what's the big deal? But for me, it's one of those things where I just have followed it in. It's the intention. Yeah. You know, I can remember, I, you know, I went from wearing, you know, browns and oranges and tans, the earth colors, to these bright, vivid colors when I had my color analysis done and found out what colors look best on this body. And, and then I just had the best time. I mean, I love wearing these dramatic colors. And I love wearing really fun earrings. And I got lots of attention from people. People were invariably commenting on my earrings because they were so different, you know, or talking about how bright my clothes were. And I just ate it up, <laughs> you know. But at some point, when I, you know, looked at this very thing David's talking about, it's like, wow, what am I doing here? What is my intention for wearing these fun earrings and these bright clothes? Well, the intention was to get exactly what I was getting, mm -hmm. the attention to the body. And when I decided that I really wanted to put my attention on my mind, and therefore I wanted to, you know, like model that, then it was, it was incongruent for me to continue wanting to get attention from my body by using jewelry and bright colored clothes for that purpose. And perfumes and low-cut dresses and, and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, you could just go on and on with it. And again, it's the, it's the purpose. It's, is it the body or the mind? And it, you could also add on to that is when you go and you meet with people, you know, flattery is something <laughs> that's really interesting to take a look at. You know, this whole thing of flattery. If you really look at the life of Jesus and, and read about it, his apostles were saying in the Urantia book, you know, he, he was not a flatterer. <laughs> Jesus did not go around complimenting and flattering like you would think. And again, it makes perfect sense from the metaphysical perspective because he was interested in their minds. Mm -hmm. He was interested in their thoughts and, and them coming to purity of thought. And he didn't, he didn't put his attention mm -hmm. onto the body. He didn't focus on the sicknesses even, the types of sicknesses, the leprosy or dead for three days, like Lazarus, or, you know, and again, it, to me, it fits again into this thing of means and end. You know, Jesus is saying, if you use the body as your end, in other words, if you want to keep all the pleasures, the conveniences, the comforts, the niceties of the world, what is the receptor of that? It's the body. <laughs> it gets to enjoy all that good stuff, so to speak, in the world's eyes, and the mind is a slave. To, to work, to be, be trained, trained for jobs, educated, sometimes for many years, to get jobs, to make money, to so on and so forth, so that the body can get the bucks, you know, and all the comforts and conveniences. And Jesus is saying, well, it's got to be turned around 180 degrees. It's, it's the, the, your goal should be peace of mind. And you should want to use your body and everything that you perceive in the world around you as a means to help bring about your peace of mind. Well, that's a that's a complete turnaround than the other way. And it's one of those things that too it seems like a loosening and a gradual turnaround. It, for, for me it wasn't something that just like one day I was reading about means and then and went, Oh I get it <laughs> <laughs> one of those things. But it, it seemed like just a little bit of questioning in, in situations more and more. What is my purpose here? Why am I going to great lengths? To, to earn this money or to go to, to do extreme things for what? For what it's for. Yeah. You know. and for me, the clothing thing, I'm thinking of an example because I wanted to say there are some people that will go wear black or get a mohawk or not shave their legs, you know, because they think that's a way of saying a statement. And uh, But I think there's a place where you, wherever you are teaching, you do kind of fit in and not draw attention one way or the other. 
And I'm thinking about at the Zen Center when I went and it was time for the service and there everybody does wear black. So I wore the closest thing to black I could, but I had orange socks. <laughs> and everybody has black socks. So everybody looked at me, you know. It immediately drew attention to me. And from that on, I asked my girlfriend, does she have black socks? And she didn't have any. And so, you know, I kind of had to let that go. But I remember feeling it was drawing attention, you know, immediately to me because everybody was in black. Now, if I, and when you go to Amrit Desai, everybody's in white. So if you come in in black, it immediately draws attention to you. So it's kind of like, what is your lesson and what are you here for? Not to draw attention. You know. It's good that you bring that up because initially when you're starting to make the shifts, it's, it's like if you're in a work setting and there's an appropriate professional clothing that you wear and you're just working on changing your mind, your forgiveness lessons, it's, it's not helpful you know, to go in there in some rags and <laughs> or something, you know, say, this is, this is simpler. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. like, that would really draw attention right. <laughs> in the work setting. Then they don't want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. You know, and you as you go on and on and on deeper and you really attempt to, to give up the world, then <laughs> it, it will come more and more, I think, where it's simplicity and mm -hmm. things. You aren't, you won't necessarily be giving talks to boards of directors and everything. They'll be disciples <laughs> sitting around you <laughs> and wanting to hear your words because of the, the training of the level of the mind. And it reminded me too of the like yellow, the yellow one. It was like, today I was reading a little bit of the uh, Siddhartha a book that Herman Hesse wrote, and they were saying that all of the uh, um, followers of the Gautama Buddha and everything and that were following him, hundreds and hundreds of them in this book, were all going around in their yellow renunciate robes. <laughs> so you got this forest with all these, these people walking around with these bright yellow robes or whatever. But again, we're just trying to... Saffron. <laughs> yeah. 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 For me, it, it came in the form of many times of experimenting, which made it fun for me in a sense, mm -hmm. and it also put parameters on it for me. You know, it's kind of like, well, there's, there's any number of things I could probably do for you know, a few weeks or whatever, a few days, and it would just be a way of me getting in touch with what my beliefs and feelings are around something. So instead of saying, well, from, you know, it's like... Taking a sacred vow. Yeah, taking a sacred vow not to do this or not to do that, that would have been ridiculous, and that would have been trying to change the form or the behavior before the change had taken place in my mind. And yet I found experimenting with the form was a way to get a closer look at or it would seem to bring up mm -hmm. for me some of the beliefs and the feelings that went with mm -hmm. it. You know, like when I, when I stopped wearing makeup, um, what I did was we went on a trip and I thought, well, you know, this would be a good time to do that. Because I think I felt like, you know, I'll never see these people again anyway. They don't know, <laughs> they don't know what I usually look like with makeup on anyway, so they're not going to say, oh my gosh, Beverly. Are you feeling okay today? You look really pale, you know. And so it just seemed like a real appropriate place, and it was really easy. I've never wanted to mess with makeup anyway, really. It's always felt like too much of a bother. And so for six weeks, I didn't wear any makeup just to see how that would feel and how I would feel about myself without makeup on. And it was real helpful. That's where you get the joy mm -hmm. from experimenting, because mm -hmm. Bev does. I'm thinking about your hitchhiking. <laughs> well, what happens usually is when I experiment, I nev I don't choose to go back. And I may, but a lot of times I haven't chosen to go back to my old way of doing it, because I've had a chance to look at why I was doing it and what it would feel like not to do it and just work through some of that mm -hmm. stuff. And so then I don't really need mm -hmm. to... I don't need the old way. And you didn't do it when it would bring you tremendous fear. No, you I did didn't. It no, I didn't do it without fear. Right. Yeah. I was thinking about your hitchhiking. Yeah. Because that was an experiment in a okay. way. Because uh -huh. it was the first time. Uh -huh. you, might, you could tell that story. Yeah. I went down to the trailer and um, left the car down there and um, hitchhiked back. And I had never hitchhiked before. We, pitch, we have picked up hitchhikers before in traveling, so I've kind of been, on, in that respect, related to hitchhiking, but not as the hitchhiker. And 
you know, it had been suggested.